Hello, Bar at Church. We are honored you are joining us today for Bar at Home. We wanted to um, go over a few things before we begin to worship. First, be sure to grab your Bible, maybe a journal and a pen. Don't forget to use the bathroom. Second, as fast as you can, we want you to set aside all distractions like phones, um, food, pets, anything else that might take your attention away. Kids are allowed to sit. Last, be prepared to take what you learned from today's sermon and put it into practice. The building may be closed, but as soon as this gathering is over, we get to be the church. Now that you're all set for Bar at Home, don't forget to share this event online if you can, and be sure to comment to let us know that you're watching. Thanks. Good morning, Bar. Welcome to Bar at Home. My name is Joel Keeley. I'm a pastor here, and I just want to start our gathering with a time of prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for this time, for this gathering, for those that have joined and are watching, engaging, uh, connecting. I just pray, Father, that you would uh, do something in us through the Holy Spirit's power, through the preaching of the word, through the, the singing of, of, of declarations of worship songs, through, through just maybe a, a comment or a message or, or something through the Holy Spirit where we just know that you're with us, Father. We're convinced of it. But Father, we also know that where two or three are gathered, you're there, that you are with us today, and we thank you for that. So Father, may you be praised, may you be worshiped, may you be adored in our gathering. We love you. We need you. Bara is your church, Father. We are about your mission. So, Father, strengthen us in the days ahead. Father, give us focus, the kind of focus that comes from knowing you. Because, Father, we just want to know you and make you known so that everyone, Father, everyone would have abundant and eternal life. Well, thank you for the blessings you've given us. Let us be grateful people, not entitled. Let us be generous, not stingy, Father. Let us move forward in this world and be love and light in darkness and difficulty. Let us be about the unification of the, the, the world, Father, about bringing people together and not dividing people. Bring an end to the pandemic, Father. Bring an end to uh, violence. Bring an end to division. Bring an end to inequality. Do the things, Father, that only you could do. We pray, Father. We ask. We, we declare we need you, Father. You are a good, good Father. Thank you for sending your amazing son. Thank you for giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And thank you for giving us grace. Turn our eyes upon you today. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. It's through your beautiful name I pray for a church I love. Amen.
so much for joining us for Bar at Home. And hey, if today is your first time joining us, or maybe you've been joining us for a little while and we haven't had the opportunity to connect with you yet, if you could click on the link in the chat or go to barachurch.com slash I am new and you give us a little bit of info today, we're going to hook you up with some Starbucks. Now let's get ready for the message. Our eyes are made up of over 2 million working parts. Your eyes start to develop just two weeks after conception. In fact, your ears, your nose, they keep growing throughout your whole life. But your eyes are the only organ that literally are the same size at birth as they are until you die. In fact, speaking of newborn babies, they cry but don't produce tears. But as you grow older, the amount of tears you produce diminishes. Now, the only cells that survive, in fact, when you live all throughout your life, are your eyes, the cells in your eyes. And the cornea is the only tissue in the human body that doesn't have a single blood vessel. I know, this is fascinating to you, it's fascinating to me. The eye is the fastest muscle in the body. Hence, when we say, in the blink of an eye, it's because eyes are fast. Speaking of blinks, a blink actually takes about 100 to 150 milliseconds, and the average person does it 4.2 million times a year. I mean, again, I'm fascinated by it. Your iPhone has like a 16 or a 12 megapixel camera. If your eyes were a camera, they would have 576 megapixels. Eyes are the second most complex organ in the body besides the brain. And speaking of brain, your eyes have functions in the front of your brain, the middle of your brain, and the back of your brain. And over 50% of your brain's processing is given to vision and eyesight. 80% of our memories come from our eyesight, and 80% of things learned come from our eyesight. Now, I know some of you guys are going, surely he's going to run out of facts. I assure you, I'm not. Do you know that dolphins sleep with one eye open, and a dragonfly has 30,000 lenses in their eyes? That's why they're so hard to catch. Snakes have no eyelids, and goats have rectangular pupils. In fact, owls are the only bird that can see the color blue. Now, the fingerprint has 40 
unique characteristics. But your retina, 256. That's why we're seeing a lot more retina scans with regards to safety. The Mayans believed that cross eyes looked attractive, and they trained their kids' eyes to become crossed. Fun fact right there. Pirates believed that wearing gold earrings improved their eyesight. And the phrase, it's all fun and games till someone gets an eye poked out, comes from ancient Rome because the only rule in their bloody mess wrestling matches was no eye gouging. And lastly, 80% of all vision impairment worldwide is curable. Well, today I want to talk about what I hope to be some curable vision impairment, some, some things with our eyes, with our eyesight, with our vision, and specifically with regards to focus that I hope will be a blessing and a benefit to all of us as we are pursuing Jesus, as we want to know him and make him known so that everyone would have abundant and eternal life. Now, we're going to focus on this series called Focus for the next five weeks. It, it's a great series that's going to take us all over the scriptures, but today we're going to start in the book of Ephesians. Paul writes Ephesians to the church in Ephesus, a church that he helped plant in his missionary journeys. He's actually in prison when he writes this book, and it's called a prison epistle. It's one of four. But what's weird about Ephesians is it's not reactive. It's not written to address a particular problem. And it's probably one of his most formal letters. His letters to the Corinthians or the Galatians had very specific issues, and he dealt with the issues personally, or he even gave information about his situation personal situation to them. But this is a very formal kind of letter. The first three chapters of Ephesians deal with a theology that if practiced and followed and, and understood, we can live out and, and, and do the actions that we'll see prescribed in the next three chapters or the last three chapters of Ephesians. Now, it's a super important book because it deals with the concept of grace. And so the first thing we're going to focus on in this series called Focus is the choice that you and I have every day and in many situations to focus on the forgiveness that you and I have in Christ, that the believer has accepted in the, the gift of God, this gift of grace, or we could focus on our failures. And I say that kind of for a little bit of alliteration purposes, but also because it's a man view. So one's God, one's man. We can focus on what God's done for us, or we could try to focus on what we're going to do for God. So we could focus on the forgiveness that we've been given in Christ, or the failures, because ultimately when we try to achieve our right standing with God on our own, we will fail. So we have this, this great opportunity to turn our eyes and our attention and our focus on two things, the forgiveness of God or our own failures on Jesus or on ourselves. And, and really this concept of grace is where we're going to go today. So we'll start in Ephesians chapter 2. And if you just follow along, I'm going to read the first 10 verses of chapter 2. Here we go. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And it's a big concept. I don't know if you heard it repeated in that short text. 
It's by grace that you've been saved. The gift of grace. So the first thing when we talk about our choice between choosing to focus on forgiveness or failures, and, we, and we're centering in, we're focusing in, turning our attention to grace, the first thing we need to understand is that our redemption matters. It is a big thing in our life. And I know sometimes we get saved and we confess Jesus and we might go to the church and get baptized in front of everybody and let everybody know that we've decided to follow Jesus. And then sometimes we forget. And that's why you see prayers in the scriptures like, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I believe for you and I, especially in these times, in this era, in this season, for us to focus, to turn our thoughts, our attentions, our heart, our mind on what God has done for us. The fact that we've been redeemed, bought back, raised up from the dead. We were dead in our transgressions, and yet God, who's rich in mercy, literally gave us the gift of grace, this free gift through the death, the horrific, tragic death of Jesus on the cross. And therefore, you and I are redeemed. You see, I think it's easy to look at the news or, or look at the current events and go, man, we got some big problems. Well, let me just tell you my view on the world today. And I don't know if this will surprise you if you'll see it coming. But for me, if I'm just shooting straight, our biggest problem on the planet today is not COVID-19. It's not racism or political division or poverty or in the environment. It's sin. It's sin. It's the thing that separates you and I from our good and loving God, our creator. And the cure, the vaccine, the, the thing that makes it all right is the cross of Christ, the death of Jesus, Calvary, Golgotha, the sacrifice of the Savior. It's the gospel. It's God doing for us what we could have never done for ourselves. That's the cure. And if we would focus on the fact that you and I in Christ have been redeemed, bought back, raised up, forgiven, man, it's going to change everything. It's going to change all the other things. But when we focus on ourselves, when we have a man-centric view to religion, when we have a checklist of rules, or we try to do things on our own to appease God or become in right standing with God, here's the two logical conclusions, the two results that we see in Scripture and I've seen in my experience on the planet. The first is pride. When we hit the mark, when we do it right, when we, when we uh, don't cuss, when we stub our toe, whatever that looks like for you, we get swallowed up with pride. We think we're something. We, we're like, hey, God, look at how good I'm doing. I, I'm giving money to the church, or I'm serving, or I didn't get mad, or I, 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 I'm really helping out. And, and pride is, is terrible. The Bible speaks over and over about the, the curse of pride and how God opposes the proud. But the other consequence or logical end of this man-centered way to uh, uh, approach God or, or obtain righteousness is self-loathing. It's condemnation. It's where you feel so terrible. You miss the mark. You do the thing that you don't want to do. You fall short, and now you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm the worst. Listen, both of those are terrible ways to live. There's no life in either one of those. But at the center of the Bible, at the center of the good news is this gift of grace. And if we would focus on that, focus on redemption, man, everything is going to open up to us. The, the second thing that we'll focus on is the fact that because we've been forgiven, it not only changes our redemption story, our salvation, our, our destiny, it's going to impact our relationships. Our relationships can be changed because we understand what Jesus has done for us. In fact, let me say it like this. We will be more likely to share the gospel when we remember what the gospel is and what the gospel does and what Jesus has done for us. It's not a one-time thing that he did and a one-time thing that we accept. The Great Commission instructs and commands us to be about telling everybody the good news that God could do for you and I what we could never do for ourselves, that we've been forgiven, set free, redeemed. And so it impacts the relationships with the lost. It, it impacts the relationships with one another. Think about competition or envy or pride or jealousy, a gossip, all these things. Like when you understand what you've been given, 
the free gift of grace? I mean, you're going to cut people slack. You're going to be long-suffering. You're gonna, the Bible says that love overlooks a multitude of wrongs. You're going to show grace because you've been given grace. And I just have to say, I would have to imagine there are some marriages that we have not shown one another grace enough. There's some families where we're not giving each other the benefit of the doubt or being patient and kind to one another. We're not living out of this blessing of of forgiveness, of redemption, and it impacts our relationships. I mean, think about even in our church family, if if we understand what God has done for us, we can disagree on politics, disagree on the the pandemic, disagree on practices and and a lot of things. But when we agree and understand that Jesus died for us and forgave us, man, it's going to impact our relationship the way we love and serve and pray for and care about one another. So a focus on the redemption, the forgiveness, the grace of God is not only going to impact our understanding of redemption in our life, it's going to impact our relationships And then I got to thinking this week, with this being Labor Day weekend, you know what else it impacts? Rest. Rest. Now, now hear me out. We have this thing called Labor Day. It it was created because the average work day was like 12 hours in the late 1800s. Uh, Kids as young as four and five worked in factories. Working conditions were terrible. Uh, Unions didn't really have much power, and so they kind of took some power and said, we're going to march, we're going to have our first parade, we're going to get into the streets and say, these are not right working conditions, these are are bad, this is not the way we should treat our employees and things like that. And so you have all these industrial centers kind of revolting, and then obviously the government took note and said, okay, we're going to have this holiday, and I think it was Grover Cleveland that signed it into a bill, but now we have Labor Day. Now, guess what we do on Labor Day? We barbecue or maybe a parade or watch some sporting events, things like that. But you know what? The thought of Labor Day is this beautiful, smart, um, really, really this appropriate thought to just shut it down and to stop and to not just keep working. Because listen, these things are connected. This, this self-focus that I talked about earlier, it plays itself out in the way we refuse to honor the Sabbath, in the way we say, oh, man, I can't sleep, or we, we wear lack of sleep like a, like a badge of pride, like, like we, we just, you know, spend Labor Day working in the yard as opposed to just resting. I was reading an article this week about a guy who was in Italy, and uh, I, I read about this thing, uh, Dolce Farnete, and, uh, and I thought, Dolce Farnete, like what, what is what is that? And so I called Philip Arambrew, who's like my resident go-between. So he talked to Vanessa, who is Mrs. Italy. And, and here's what that means. Sweet doing nothing. It literal transla- it's literal translation is sweet doing nothing or sweet idleness. And I thought, man, what is that? And it was this mindset. It's this kind of attitude. Around four or five, man, people in Italy, they just stop. And they go to a restaurant or a cafe and they have some wine or they have some, a, some bite, a bite to eat and they just spend time talking to each other. They just don't do anything. Now we kind of have a watered down, a little weird version of that called happy hour. But, but listen, man, I think for us, especially now, we're uptight, we're stressed, we're worried, we're fearful. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to lose our jobs. We don't want to have, have a, a riot in our, our neighborhood. We're like We got all these things. And I think rest gets um, attacked. If we would focus on the fact that God is in control and that God can do for us what we can't do for ourselves, even that concept of rest will be impacted by a focus on the gospel, by a focus on the gift of grace. If we say, you know what? Yeah, there's some crazy things going down, but you know what? I'm going to rest because God is on his throne. None of this is taken in by surprise, and I'm going to trust that my God is a good, good father. So all these things, just by focusing on what Jesus has done, impact so many other areas of our life. Um, I, I don't know, this is a weird thing, but I, I didn't plan this. I just 
made an eye appointment like a month and a half ago. And then like a month ago, I, I said, Lord, what do we got? And this is where he led me into this series on focus. Well, earlier this week, in fact, yesterday, I went into the, to the optometrist just two doors down to Kelvin. Great doctor, great optometrist. Highly recommend him. Give him a shout out. Whoop. But I forgot why I was going there. And I walk in there and they take your temperature and put the hand, you know, the hand sanitizer on. And then they go to the back and they just sprayed my hands with hand sanitizer. And then they said, well, wash your hands. And I'm thinking, man, this is a little overkill and excessive. I get it. You're committed. But the reason I was washing my hands had nothing to do with COVID. It was because he hands me these two little packages and inside are contact lenses. Well, I forgot that I had mentioned like a month and a half ago, hey, I think I'd like to try contact sometime. So he ordered me some. And now I'm sitting in front of a mirror with this contact lens on my finger, and I am trying to figure out how to cram this this thing onto my eye. Well, I did it, and instantly I could see. I put it in the next eye, and I could see, and I was like, these things are awesome. So I'm wearing contact lenses. But then I thought, why are they called contact lenses? So I went to the World Wide Web, to Google. You know why? Not because of what da Vinci did in the 1500s, which was fill a bowl with water and put your face in it. And, and he, his theory was that you would be able to see better with this liquid, and it would magnify, and the, and the curve of the bowl would help. But, but there's a problem with that. You can't really breathe underwater. So the, the water goggles that da Vinci created didn't work. Then about 100 years later, another guy took a test tube and stuck it on the eye and put wax on it, like literally had a test tube on the eye and thought that the, the curve of the lens on it, but it was too far away. And so literally for the next 200 years, nothing really was developed or advanced in that area until the late 1800s, early 1900s, when somebody says, what if we could get the glass and have it contact, stick, attached to the actual eye. Hence, contact lenses. Well, see, what we're talking about in this series is that the scriptures and Jesus himself become the lenses in which we see everything around us. And so I want us to contact the Savior. I want us to connect with Jesus in this series like we've never done before, to be that close to him, to to press in and to go, what would you do? What would you say? How would you see this situation? And we'll, we'll go down through the series and talk about a bunch of different things and choices that we have about how to view things. But first, start with the gospel. Start with the beautiful, sweet gift of grace. And as we move into this moment, this time for communion, I can't think of a better thing to do than to consider, to think about, to focus in, to lock our attention in on what Jesus did for us. You know, the last sentence in the Bible is interesting. It's in Revelation 22. It's verse 21, and it's a prayer that, the, that John writes as, as he's ending this this revelation. Here's what he says. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Man, that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you. If you're watching for the first time, that's my prayer for you. If you're far away from God, that's my prayer for you. For you, if you've never received the grace, the free gift of salvation that Jesus did earn accomplished for us on the cross, you've never done that, man, I pray that you would do it today, that you would say yes to that gift today so that the grace could be on you, that it would be with you, that it would be in you, that you would focus on it daily and it would change. It will, listen, it will change everything. I'm going to pray for that to happen right now. Oh, Father, I pray that we would know that focusing on forgiveness, this gift of grace, the the incredible grace you've given us, man, it's going to change everything. And so we won't have to, to fight for a blessing. We will live from the blessing. It'll improve our relationships. We'll give grace to others. We'll freely give away the gospel and share the good news because we know we've received such a great gift. It's going to give us the peace that is necessary for us to rest. Oh, Father, I pray 
that we would know that grace is so good and we would want to know Jesus and make him known because he is the giver of grace. It's because of what he did for us that we receive this great gift that literally allows us to have an abundant and eternal life because what you did for us, God, that we could never do for ourselves. Oh, Father, please, may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with all of God's people. And I pray that prayer through the beautiful and strong name of Jesus for a church I love. Amen. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. only one who could ever save. 
for joining us for Bar at Home. And if this is your first time to join us or we've yet to connect, will you do us a favor and go to barchurch.com slash I am new or click the link in the comments and there you can fill out a little information and we would love to hook you up with a Starbucks gift card. And in addition to that, uh, we have an event called Genesis coming up on Sunday, September 27th. If you go to barchurch.com slash events, there you can find a link to sign up. And again, that will be in person or online if you're choosing following the 10 a.m. gathering. And it's a great chance to find out the history and the heart of Bar Church. And we'd love to see you there. And then finally, we have Vision Night coming up. Uh, Monday night, September 14th at 7 p.m. Again, you can go to barchurch.com slash events. There you can sign up to attend in person or online as, as it is a night for us to just to continue to see this year of vision gathered together outside of a Sunday morning and enjoy some time together. So mark that on your calendars and please, again, you can join online or in person. Thank you again for joining us. I'm going to pray for us and then we will go out and be the church. Dear God, thank you again for a chance to, to meet in together and, and to be together. And Lord, I pray that you would use us this week as always. Just let us be full of your Holy Spirit. Let us see each other uh, in joy and in kindness and, and, and let us love people well, Lord. And so whatever is heavy on our hearts, can we lay, the, lay that at your feet? And would you just let us feel overwhelmed with your love? Thank you for all you've given us. Help us to keep our focus on you and others. Thank you for the opportunity to be your sons and daughters. Let us not take that lightly and let us not forget how amazing that is. Thank you for all you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next Sunday, Barham.